today. We exalt and humble you. We thank you for the privilege to stand here in your presence today. Being the first day of the week, the day that we have made, that we should rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, today we rejoice in your presence as we are about to open some mysteries in the book of Revelation. Father, Lord, God of all, let your word be real in our mouth. Confirm every word that proceeds from my mouth with signs and wonder following it. Lord, as you have promised me, even so do in my life. Let only your name alone be glorified. Let from now to the end of the earth that the people may know the truth, and the truth they know and believe will set them free. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today, brethren, we are into another technical area of the Bible which is called the marriage feast of the Lamb. The marriage feast of the Lamb. This is where we use the opportunity for the world to understand what is marriage. And does the Lord Jesus Christ actually involve himself in a true wedding at today? Or what does it mean to the history of mankind when we talk about the marriage feast of the Lamb. The marriage feast of the Lamb. This is a period of time in history when the children of God will be gathered together for a seven years marriage feast. What are the biblical significance of a seven years marriage feast instead of just a single day wedding as we have heard today? Why is it seven years? Why not seven days? Why not seven weeks? Then we shall be looking into this when the time comes. And God bless you today as you use the opportunity to understand what God is speaking about and what the Spirit is teaching the church. And as you understand and put your mind to it, God blessing your life will be a reality. Brethren, this is another opportunity for the Word of God. There is no Word of God that is too big or too small. God expects us to teach the truth, to be instant in season and out of season, to do the work of an evangelist, to attain a full proof for our ministry. This is what He expects from us. Christians are not Christian because they attend churches. They are Christians because they follow the pattern of Christ. They live and behave like Christ. And all this will be eminent. There will be a separation between good and evil at the end of the day. That is the purpose of this teaching. Today, we shall be taking a clue, our time to look into it, into the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the union and the consummation of all things. When the saints of God in heaven will be gathered together for a period of seven years for a marriage supper, where is this thing found in the Bible? Is it true that the saints will go through a period of marriages? Yes, we can find it all through the scriptures, both in the New Testament and Old. And today, there is a key person that will be significant in this teaching is in the book of Judges, which is Ruth and Naomi. Ruth is a judge in Israel, and Naomi was her mother in law. They will came to explain to you what it means to be the king's man redeemer. And what is the Levite marriage feast? What it symbolizes? How does it apply to us? But today we teaching is supposed to be about prophecy. How come we want to use opportunity to go into the Levite wedding? Because that we explain the reason for the seven years marriage feast and the meaning of King's man redeemer. And who is worthy. So this is exactly what we're going to be talking about. Today we will be using Indian from the scripture 
that symbolizes the gathering of the church. Like when we use the word wedding in the church. Christ is speaking about literal marriage in your home. But in the other word, he's also speaking about the church. Because the church is his bride. So when we talk about the bride of the Lord, we are actually talking about the church. The church is the Lord's bride. He brought us to existence. He adopted us. He grafted us into the body of Christ. We, the Gentile, were not by nature the children of Abraham. In fact, we were alien for the covenant of promise. We were in time past not a people who were not part of the covenant that God gave to Abraham and the children of Israel. But this covenant, how did Christian mysteriously became part of this covenant? That is true marriage. And how did this marriage happen? Christ. He spoke to us as seed, not as seeds. That means one seed, Christ himself. He is the root and the offspring of David. Through his death, for the sins of the entire world, he paid the full bright price for sin. And that bright price he paid for our sin had grafted us into the family of God through wedding. So that's why when we talk about, through this teaching, the bride of the Lord is not talking about marriage, that Jesus is literally going to take a wife. No. In heaven, there is neither marrying nor given in marriage. Jesus himself says so. We are like sons of God. We are like angels in the resurrection. There is no marriage, no given in marriage. Every man will answer for himself in the judgment of God. But why is the tense marriage here significant? That is what we try to lay the foundation and the basis for today's teaching. Marriage, feast of the Lamb. Why does the Lamb bind marriage in heaven? And he himself is taking part in a marriage feast. But this union is not between him and woman. is between him and the church. The union between Christ and the church is known as marriage. Just like last week when we speak about idolatry, we are not talking about idolatry in the extent of a writing an idol, but in the terms of false worship. So today we are looking at the terms in the book of Revelation, the marriage feast of the Lamb. These terms have to do with spiritual wedding spiritual marriage the marriage between the church and the son of abraham jesus christ and that brings us into the promises that god made to abraham in the beginning and what are these promises in genesis god said to abraham i will bless anyone that bless you and anyone that costs you i will curse and he also make him a promise that it is only through Abraham that all family of the earth will be blessed. And that promise was fulfilled in Christ. The blessing we can have today, the blessing of deliverance, the blessing of faith, the blessing of salvation, the blessing of prosperity, even as a Christian, Muslim, Buddha, whatever, can only come from one source. There is no salvation in any other. There is no name given under heaven by which a man can be set free, except that of the son of Abraham, Jesus Christ. He is the offspring and the offspring of David, the root and the offspring of David. He, though being a son of Abraham, brought Abraham to existence because he is the I am. So that is exactly whom we are looking into today. So, having to understand this background, I want us to go to the book of Revelation to lay the foundation of the premises of this teaching. We said in Revelation 18, and I read it from verse 6, and it said, Reward her even as she has rewarded you. Here he was speaking about the woman, the mystery Babylon. But after he finished that particular judgment on the woman, 
and determined that she should endure in that verse 6. But something else the angel took John to show him. He took him away to see something very significant. Something that many of the church are willing to see and even die, many of the apostles of God. After the judgment of the harlots, God has come to reward his blood in the book of Revelation. This teaching is very clear in Revelation chapter 19 from verse 1. He said, And after this thing, and I heard a great voice as of many much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and power unto the Lord our God. For the true and righteous are his judgment. For he has judged the great hall, which corrupts the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of the servants at her, at her hands. After the hallows, the mother of all false doctrine and religion was judged. God decided time has come to reward the saints. The reward of the saint is what we call the marriage feast of the Lamb. And again, they said, Hallelujah, her smoke has sent rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, which symbolizes the mystery church, and the four beasts or living creature fell down and worshiped God that sat on the truth, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And this is what we call Christendom. And the voice came out of the truth saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, the voice of many waters, and as the voice of many thundering, Say, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. The all powerful reigns. The Lord God, the all powerful reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife has made herself ready. The marriage of the Lamb of God. And the bride itself has made himself ready. So that is what we have been looking, what we'll be looking into today. Marriage. What does it mean to celebrate marriage? Marriage is wedding. In Greek, we call it feasts or literally meals served to celebrate a wedding. And why do we wed people? In the literal world, where do you need to join two things together? When you take something, or in another word, engraft. To engraft, take a foreign tree and take it to another tree and engraft it together. It just for example, you have a grape tree. You don't like grape. You want orange instead. You can cut a branch of orange and I graft it to a grape tree. And the tree, though it be a grape tree, the orange will collect nutrients for the body of the grape tree and produce orange for you that you want. The part that is not grafted will still produce grape. But the other part will produce orange because you have grafted it into the orange tree. That is what we call marriage. Marriage is an engraftment. You take two bodies and you unite it or combine it together. You graft it together to become one. And so that is what marriage is called. Marriage is not two. It's not a union of two. It's a union of one. Binding of two things together to make it one. When you graft an orange to grape, they does not automatically become both orange and grape tree but they become orange tree. 
So the same thing, if you take two bodies together, every tree is known by its fruit. If you graft an orange into a grape, instead of producing grape, it produces orange. The grape tree becomes an orange tree. So because every tree is known by its fruit. And therefore, if you take a believer, the body of Christ, and you take an idol worshiper, you graft them together, they become one. And what you have just done, you have committed an abomination in the sight of the Lord by joining the body of Christ with Satan. And which you know, two of them cannot live in the same house. So as a result, you begin to experience confusion and difficulties in the marriage system. So that is why Christ keeps telling the believers what fellowship has the body of Christ with an idol. What concord have Christ with Belial? And him that believeth, with him that believeth not, you cannot serve God and mammon. You have to choose one. So this is exactly why God is talking about that statement. Because Christians, we are not the original Jews, as you may hear from many church that we are the spiritual Israel. No, we were grafted into that body. God stopped dealing with them. He consumed them for a period of time until the mystery church is over. The body of Christ was grafted in so that some of the Gentiles can be saved. God separated Abraham from the beginning, chosen through faith. So any man to be that has faith become the original seed of Abraham. Though not through birth, but through faith. So that is the reason why some people keep asking, if Christ died for the world, why do we need to have faith to receive salvation? Because that faith is what grafts you into the body of Christ. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. If you come to God, Abraham believed in God. Abraham was not a righteous man per se. He believes in God. But God looked into his belief and counted it to him for righteousness. Today, if you also believe, though you be not righteous, through your faith in God, you can be made righteous. So faith was accounted to God for righteousness in the case of Abraham. And that's why the Bible said to us in Habakkuk 2, 2 that the just shall live by faith. What makes a just people that believe by faith, though they have not seen, but they have testimonies and they have confidence in God, and as a result, it was imputed unto them for righteousness. And this is the reason. Why, when we talk about the church coming together as the body of Christ, we are talking together as the church being one with Christ in marriage, being grafted into Christ, and as a result, children of Abraham. That is why we said, Abraham blesses, we sing this song every Sunday, Abraham blesses a man, even though we are not of the folks of Israel. We are not of the original seed of Abraham. We belong to the church. The church is neither Jews nor Gentile. But today, we call ourselves the children of Abraham through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is Christ? Christ was of the tribe of David, a seed of Abraham. But he came to adopt the covenant, to fulfill the covenant. God made with Abraham in Genesis, where he told him that through his seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And that seed was Jesus. And Jesus was the grandson of Ruth and Boaz. He was also the grandson, strangely, of Rahab, who he despised in the plain of Jericho. So therefore, through this seed of Abraham, we today can call ourselves the children of God. Not because we came from Israel, not because we are the spiritual Israel, but because through adoption we were grafted into Christ. Having faith in Christ. The only thing that connects us with Abraham is having the same faith that Abraham had. That make us the spiritual sons of Abraham. Then, let's come back to our today's topic. The marriage feast of the Lamb. Before we continue, I want us to go to the book of Ephesians, 
the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 27. Ephesians 5, 27. Let's know what God says about this marriage of a thing. The marriage feast. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 27. Ephesians 5, verse 27 said, That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Everybody that wants a wife, think about one. The sanctity of the wife. That means the purity. Thinks about the chastity of the wife. The beauty of the wife. Which in our case, the righteousness of the saints. So when we talk about this, when it comes to marriage, Christ is not looking for a different quality. I've never seen a man looking for a wife. What, sir? what are you looking for, sir? I'm looking for a wife. Say, so what type of wife? I'm looking for a heart, or I'm looking for somebody that beat his spirit, that is ready to insult his elder, or I'm looking for somebody that will wreck me. No man looks for such a wife. So Christ certainly is not looking for a wife that is unruly. He is looking for a bride. And who bride are you? And who is this bride that he's looking for? He has to be clean. First, sanctified, presented to himself a glorious church, not having anything like spots or any wrinkle or any of such things. But this church has to be presented to God as a glorious church. That is the church Christ is looking for. Today the question is, are you ready to be that church? Or the property that belongs to such church? Church that is first purified, church that is glorious, church that has no stain, church that there is no recall. That is the church Christ is looking for. Do you want to be a member of such a church? That is the question you need to ask yourself today. God is looking for a church that is without any blemish. It must be holy. It must be clean. It must be purified. So ought men also to love their wife as what? Their own body. So God is talking about the kind of relationship between husband and wife. To love him as they love their body. What man yet loved his body so much that he hated it? That he doesn't wash it with water. He doesn't, he wants it to get dirty and injured. He wants it to be abused. No man. So husband must not do the same to their wife. Just as Christ expects the church to also purify themselves, sanctify themselves, anoint it daily, Cleanse it daily, purify it daily, so that it will meet the taste of Christ when he shall come. So this is the quality of the bride that God is looking for. And he said, He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. Because the wife is engrafted to the husband. Just as the church is engrafted to the to Christ, Christ loved the church. To what extent he gave himself for it? Christ loved the church. He gave his life on behalf of the church. The question today is: Do you love your wife? Do you love? Christ as much as he loved you. He loved you so much that he was ready to die for your sake. Take your sin to the cross and he was hanged on a wooden tree so that you and I don't have to pay the ultimate price. He paid the ultimate price for your sake and for my sake. 
So the same thing, if we love God, we must first and foremost love the brethren. Any man that maltreats his wife, maltreats his own body. So any member of the church that disobeyed God or Christ, disobeyed his or her own body. Because you are part of the body of Christ. If you stand and disregard the laws of God, you are actually disregarding your own laws and your own life. And that's what the Bible says, Thou shalt know the Lord thy God. Do you know why? Because he is your life. Your life flows from him. And your life flows through him. There is no God outside him. There is no rock outside him. Your vision, your ability, your future, everything that you will become in life, flow from him and through him. Now, in verse 29, For no man ever yet hates his own flesh, but nourishes, cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. No man hates his own life. So the same way he washes himself, he purifies himself, he sees beautiful cloth in the market, he says, this will be good for me. So the same thing, you should do to God. So the same thing God is asking of his bride. He's not asking you to do things out of the ordinary. Somebody said to me to serve God is very hard. How will to serve God be very hard? But yes, you pick up a drink one day. You say, I'm old enough. I want to get a wife. And you search around and you look for a wife. And you pay the price and you marry her. Why did you marry her if it's too heavy a load for you? Nobody forced any man to get married. So you never were forced to partake in the offering or the suffering of Christ. You choose it of your own volition. Why is the load too heavy that you want to pull it off now? Marriage is to be enjoyed, not endured. When Adam saw the first woman, Eve, he said, This is the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they both shall become one flesh. He said, The twin are no longer twin, but one. Adam understands the meaning of marriage. That's why marriage is not for children. He understands that to be married, mean you have to be grafted in. It's not something you have to hurry into. You know you have to leave, take a leave from your father. Some of us get married, we live with our father in the same house. We live with our mother in the same house. We call it marriage. No. If you want to get married, you should first and foremost Leave your father house. Leave your mother house. Be joined to your wife. And they both become one flesh. Now let's go about the leverage wedding. What are the laws of the leverage wedding as pertains to today's teaching? The laws of the leverage wedding is marriage is normally at an appointed time. Fair to have the betrothal. When a woman is betrothed, but nowadays we no longer betrothed. When a woman is betrothed to a man, it is his wife. The Bible says, if at that point of betrothal, the man said, I'm no longer going to marry her because I found no cleanliness in her. It shall be examined before the elders. And the woman if you find an uncleanness in the woman that is betrothed to a man, she will be stoned to death. That's why she is not yet his wife. That was the laws of the Old Testament. And I believe some culture still practice it to today. Even some religious zealots. But let's get some certain perfect structures. This 
betrothers were not married yet, but because she was betrothed to a man, and uncleanliness was found in her heart, she should be stoned to death according to the laws of Moses. But at this point in time, now let's think about that for a moment. Betrothed or not married? What do they go and I call engagement? But this point in time, this was the loss until grace came and all these things were taken out of the way. God made it to his cross, bring an end to that region. But what is the second rule in Levite wedding? There is what we call the payment of bride price. When the bride price is paid in the Levite wedding, the woman is not automatically your wife. You don't take her home because you have paid the bride price. That's why she is betrothed to you. That's why the bride price is paid, as in the case of Mary and Joseph. Joseph has already paid her bride price. She was betrothed to Joseph, but he was not yet his wife. For you to be able to get a wife in Levite marriage, you have to go and separate yourself from your father's house. You have to have an additional house or a room in addition to your father's house. You must leave your father's and your mother. So that you with your wife can start a new life. That is the loss of the Levite wedding. And this wedding was participated to. And what is the last step is the consummation of the wedding that was explained by Jesus Christ himself. The marriage feast. The marriage feast is all about celebration. The marriage feast is the last clamors of all the wedding. These clamors happen when the priest or the groom has to come in an eminent return, eminent, unexpected, and take away his bride. It's called the fun of it. He come unexpected into the wedding. The virgins who are the bridesmaid or the chief bridesmaid, whatever you call them, they wait without waiting. They don't know the time the bridegroom will come. And that is the fun of the wedding, of the left right marriage. And when the bridegroom come unexpectedly, they enter into a period of seven days marriage feast. The marriage feast is not one day. In the left right wedding, but seven days marriage feast. I could see why when Jesus attended the marriage in Cana in Galilee, about the third day, wine ran out because the groom thought he was well prepared. But unfortunately, the guest he had was more than his capacity could carry. So that is why you have to, after paying bride price, you have to go and prepare for the marriage feast. Because it's a feast, people must come to eat and drink for seven days in your house. That is the loss in the Levite wedding. And that seven days, you can plan for your wedding for as long as God as it takes. So the woman does not know when you will be ready. When you are ready, you come in to cut away your wife. And that day is known as the marriage feast. All the virgins enter and the door is locked. And the marriage starts for a period of seven days. And the Bible, in Dion, speaking in idiom, seven years, we already understand from the book of Daniel that that seven years stand for, that seven days stand for seven years period, which is known as the Sabbath of years. So we celebrate the left right wedding on earth for seven days, but in heaven is going to be celebrated for seven years period. That's why the marriage feast of the Lamb for the Christian is seven years paid. Today we are going to be taking a dive into this marriage issue in heaven. The virgins, what did they do in the book of Matthew? 
they waited with cows. They were expecting the bridegroom to show up. They heard that the day was given for the wedding. They waited. They thought maybe the bridegroom would come in the afternoon. So we will start the wedding immediately. But strange enough, the virgin could not wait. Till 12 o'clock in the night, people that were in the morning, they took oil. The oil in their lamps ran dry. Only a few, who were five of them who were wise, took additional oil. Because they know it's going to be a long waiting time. That the bridegroom may not show up at the time they expected him. The man can tell you, don't worry, I will come back next year to fix your marriage and take you home. But on getting to his business, his finance could not meet up in two years. So you may end up waiting for five years instead of two years. But in our case, how does this relate to us as Christians? Christ has come. Because of time, I will not go through the book of Esther to explain the king's small redeemer. Christ has come. He is worthy. How do we know he's worthy? He has not had the shoe pull off. In Israel, if you read the book of the book of Judges about Ruth and Naomi, many of you know it in the Bible, you can read it on your own. You can understand what it means to have your shoe pull off. That means you are not worthy to take your brother's wife who he dies and leave, your brother's widow. So as a result, whoever the next nearest kid's mother is worthy, we have to take your brother's widow and fulfill the rights and obligation to her. So, in the case of Ruth, because she was from a different land, the land of the Philistine, an enemy of Israel, the man who was worthy refused, Etok. And therefore, a man named Boaz stood up in his place and took off this. Christ is our Boaz. He is the worthy king's man, redeemer. And because he's worthy, he paid our full bride price. How was our bride price paid? He was paid on the cross by dying. Why was he need for bride price? Man deliberately sinned against God and convicted himself before the world and before Satan. And therefore, Satan sinned against God from heaven. We don't understand the reason why that Christ has to die for us to be freed. Satan sinned in the beginning, and as a result, he lost his Ocoteria, his own place of inhabitation, and was thrown down to the earth because of his sin. And when he came, he deceived man, who was the perfect image of God, which God has created for himself, for an, as an object of his glory. But man rebelled against his maker. Therefore, guilty of the same faith as Satan, who rebelled against God in heaven and was thrown down. Man also lost his inhabitation, the garden. The garden of truths, which God promised the saints he would give to those who love his appearance. We lost our foundation in that garden. And because man lost it, he was thrown out of the garden. But God lost man. He has been looking for a way to bring man back to the same garden, which we lost in the beginning. And that's why he sent Jesus Christ to pay the full price for the sins of mankind. That becomes our bright price. And the only way to taste two things that are unlike and bind them together. Adam was the son of God because God created him. Now, Adam lost the right of sonship because of sin in eating the fruits that God warned him not to eat. And that right of sonship was lost in the beginning. But how do we get it back? In human station, remember the song, 
Though our tears forever flow, all for sin cannot atone. No amount of blood sacrifice could atone for the sins of mankind. The splitting of goats and the blood sacrifice could not make the offender clean. The Bible says if they were able to, there will be no need to continue to offer them every year. The fact that we offer sacrifice according to the leverant rites every year is because the sacrifice offered from sin could never make the offender clean. But Christ said to the Lord, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not desire. Therefore say, I, I come in the volume of thy book to do thy will as it is written of me. And he said, A body that has prepared me. That body was to be offered for our sin once and for all because he has a testimony that he lives forever. There is no more need for every year of offering of sacrifice. Because with one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. That was the reason why the bright price was fully paid on the cross. What about the reminders of the coming of the bridegroom? It happens every day throughout the period of the apostles. John gave us the book of Revelation. Pastors preaching in your streets. Evangelists sharing tracts on every way. Reminding you that your husband, the bridegroom, will soon return. Amen. To take home his bride. But the question today is, when the Lord comes, shall he still meet you a virgin? Chastised, purified, sanctified, met for the master's purpose? Or shall he mean that you have stained yourself with all form of worldliness, corruption of the flesh, and things that are not pleasing in his sight? If you know that the Lord will soon come to execute judgment upon your righteous sinner, upon all that your righteous sinners has ungodly committed, what manner of man you ought to be? Ought you not to purify yourself, sanctify yourself, Prepare yourself to meet him at every time. Especially since we don't know when the bridegroom will return. Because the bridegroom can return today. He can return tomorrow. He can return at midnight. At a time you don't expect him. And at hours you are not looking for him. He will show up. And when he show up, will you be ready? In the case of Boaz, Boaz was worthy. He made sure everything was prepared. That Ruth and Naomi was well taken care of. And when they gave birth to his son, he says, Naomi has given birth to his son. And he shall replace the lost son, Boaz, and Obed. And those whose lineage Christ himself came from. Now, why do we go through this history? I want you to understand when we talk about the marriage feast, which pattern it takes. That is not church marriage. That I have my marriage next week on Sunday. The groom either come or the marriage is over. No. But this one is an eminent return. What did Christ say to the apostles? In my father's house, there are many mansions. I go to repair a place for you, which is the normal thing. Because according to the left right marriage, the bride cannot put his wife in his father's house permanently. He is going to prepare a special occasion, a special inhabitation for the bride. And that's why he has gone for the past 2,000 years. Preparing such a place for you. And when he's finished, he is coming for his bride. To take you to himself. So that where he is. There will his servant be also. So, brethren, the Lord is coming to take his bride. Will you be part of that bride that the Lord is coming to take? Or will you be preferred to stain yourself with all worldly things and things that does not satisfy? The Lord said, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and loses his souls? 
Now let's go back to our study on the marriage feast of the Lamb. Revelation 19 from verse 1 to 14. Revelation 19, 1 to 14. Now we are in verse 3. He said, and again I say this, Hallelujah, her smoke has rose up forever. In verse 4 he says, for the four and twenty elders they fell down. Let's go to verse 9. And he said unto me, What? Let's read from verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. So when God was telling us about the Leverage wedding, he is not mistaken. He is referring to the marriage feast of the Lord Jesus Christ. So things that you see on earth were ordained by God. The pattern of the temple, the pattern of the marriage in the Levite cultures were stated by God. And these same cultures were patterned and confirmed after the things to come. They are symbols of things to come. Symbol of the things in heaven. No wonder Christ said to the Pharisees, search the scripture. Indeed, he thinks he have hope. They are all of them that testifies of men. So these scriptures actually was fulfilling Christ's vision when he was speaking about the Levite wedding. So Christ is making it clear to you today. The marriage that Christ has promised you is coming. The Bible says the bride has made herself ready. Today can the church boldly say we are ready. When my Lord does come, I will be ready. I will be ready when that day shall come. Oh yes, I will be ready. You will be ready when my Lord shall come. Your Lord is coming. And when he comes, will you be ready? Will you be prepared like Sarah, who was so chastised, chastened, that he called Abraham Lord? Now, how ready are you when the Lord does come to take home his bride? Will you tell the Lord, I still have things that I have not cleared? I still have so many things in my plate that I'm not yet ready for the wedding? The Lord is saying that the marriage feast of the Lamb is come and his wife must make herself ready. <laughs> and her to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. That's why when we want to do wedding to the church, there's why some bride filled with all kind of abomination. Yes, we give them white garment. The reason is because we want to show that the white garment is the righteousness of the saints. That is what it symbolizes. We bring the white, the purity of the saints into the matrimonial home. Because the Bible says marriage is honorable when the bed is undefiled. We are really having a fine linen, clean and white. For this fine linen is what? The righteousness of the saints. The saints must make himself righteous to be worthy. The Lord is not coming for a dirty church. The Lord is coming for a glorious church. A church that has faith. A church that believes in God and it was imputed unto them for righteousness. A church that does not leave the righteousness of God to seek after their own righteousness. Therefore, making God a liar. If any man says he has no sin, he is a liar and he make God a liar. And the truth is not in him. And therefore, these are people who were bought with the price. They have been made wash. What? It was granted to be arraigned. They were not already purified. They were not already righteous. They were not already holy. No. The righteousness of the saints was imputed unto them. That's why the righteousness was as white as linen. Because the Bible makes it clear to us, no man can be righteous because all our righteousness as a man is a filthy rag. All our righteousness, no matter how holy the man is on earth, before God is as filthy as a rag. But God said here it was granted to 
for her. That means what God is talking about here is not our own righteousness. So when we talk about salvation, we are not talking of individual righteousness. We are talking of the righteousness of Christ in us. And that righteousness is the righteousness which the saints pursue. When we say a man is a saint, it's not saint because he's sinless. He says because he has accepted Christ and have confidence in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That is where his righteousness springs from. And this righteousness is what we are pursuing today. And as a Christian, you must have this on the back of your mind. That you can be a good giver. You can be a good church attender. You can be even the pastor, the bishop, has names, has status in the society. But if your robe is not purified, and you don't have the righteousness of the saints, that is without blame, free from wrinkle and any such thing, you will not see your Lord. And he said, in verse 9, he said, Unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true saints of God. If you are called to this marriage feast, you qualify to be enlisted as the true saints, not fake saints. Not saints because you are canonized. No, we are talking of the real saints. If you want to be a true saint, you have to participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb. In verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true. Righteous, and in righteousness does he judge and make war. The Lord is coming for his bride. Now, let's get something from the book of Matthew. To explain all these teachings about the marriage feast. Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Matthew 22, I read from verse 1 to 14. He said, and Jesus answered and spoke unto them again by the prophet, by the parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. And he went, and he set forth his servant to court them that were biding, or bidding, or word to the wedding. And they would not come. And again, he set forth other servants and tell them which were by them. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My us, my fatlings are all killed. And all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. And they made light of it and went their way. One to his farm, another to his merchandise. They refused to attend his wedding. Then the Rama took his servant and they and treated them spitefully and slew them because they came to give them invitation. But the king had heard thereof, he was wrought. He set forth his army and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. For the marriage of the Lamb to take place in heaven, God has finished his judgment, avenging the earth dwellers, himself on the earth dwellers. Before his marriage of the saints can be accomplished. Because the Lord is not going to bind the righteous and the wicked together. No. The righteous must be separated from the wicked. This period we're talking about, many of us say, okay, because it's written at the end of Re Revelation, that means it takes place after the great tribulation. No. The moment you leave the earth and you depart in the rapture to heaven, you are already participating in the marriage feast of the Lamb. It's for a period of seven years 
during those seven years period, that is when the scrolls will be opened, the bowls will be thrown out, the trumpets will sound. They are all within the event of the marriage. The saints are going to be looking on the earth from it. Those are the excitement. It's like the fireworks at wedding. The judgment of the earth. So the saints will watch all these things from on high. They will not be on earth to experience it. This marriage we're talking about here. God showed you the purpose for this wedding in this verse. First, people were ready who were qualified to be invited. The wedding, the people that were the original seed of Abraham, those were the people that you think they are qualified to attend the marriage of the son of Abraham, of the seed that brought David to existence, Jesus Christ. But none of those men that they invited the wedding. They took light. The day the Lord called them to attend his wedding, that is the day they realize they have to go to farm. Some of them remember my business is not going the way I want it to. So I decided to do something else. I want to worship idol. While some of them took the prophets God sent to them to announce his wedding and his coming invitation and they killed them. They hung to the cross. They stoned the rest. At last, even the king decided, I will send my son. They said, surely let's come, let's kill the son. Because this one will inherit all things. And they kill him. God is saying to you, He sent His army. That is what happened in the whole book of Revelation. God is sending His army, taking back possession of the earth. The earth has long been in the hand of Satan. God is sending His army, taking back authority, destroying the wicked from the earth, and restoring the glory of the earth back to Himself. That is what this place is talking about. What the scriptures talk about in the marriage feasts, the parable of the wedding feast, and the parable Jesus appeared in the New Testament in Luke 14, from verse 7 to 14. Let's read it. Luke 14. Luke 14, from verse 7. He said, he put forth a parable to those who were he invited. And when he marked how they chose out the chief room, saying unto them, When thou art biding for any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room. Don't let them invite you to party. And you said, Okay, ah, God has invited me to this party. Give me the chair that is made for the king or the governor of the feast. I will sit here. The Lord said, when the man that is better than you come, they will betray you. And then, you will be given the least place in the wedding. Humble yourself under the mighty arms of the Lord, so that in God's time, you will be exalted. Don't exalt yourself. You will be humbled. And God says, in verse 9, he bade thee him, come and say unto thee, Give this man a this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest place. In verse 10, if thou art by him, go and sit down in the lowest seat or the lowest room. When he that bided him come, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. And thou shalt be worshipped in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. Don't look for a position in the ministry. Worship God. Take the least seat. Take the back seat. Walk from the back. Let others see Jesus in you. Don't use man to tell them about Christ. Let Christ minister through your deed. Whoever, whosoever shall exalt himself, the same will be abased. But whoever hmm, that humble himself shall be exalted. He said this unto them to buy him, that make a dinner and a supper, and call her friends, not thy friends, nor thy bedroom, 
but neither that neither thy king's men nor the rich neighbor, lest they also buy thee again and recompense thee. When I invite you for wedding, don't bring all your rich people so that tomorrow, when they are also having feast, they will also invite you and say, Okay, he give all to us, we also give to him. God is saying, When you are invited, go for the beggar, the orphan, the widow, the poor, and those who cannot pay the game. You should invite them. But at that same wedding, a man was found without a wedding garment. But he was asked the question, friends, how come you came here without a wedding garment? How? I thought the wedding was free for all. Yes, but you have to have rules that coordinate the occasion. And that means you must have the righteousness that comes with the same. Salvation is free, but it says you are sanctified. The true saint of God, having the faith that Abraham had, that makes him a friend of God, you will not be allowed at the table in the wedding feast of the Lamb. In verse 15, one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, and he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade men, and a servant unto supper to him, saying unto them, They that we abide, come all ye things that are now ready. And he cons and they all with one consent began to make excuse. First one said to him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must need to go and see it. I pray thee. We have made excuse. And another said, I've just bought five weeks of us. The other said, I've just married a wife. The other said, That servant came and showed the Lord these things. And the master, being filled with anger, said to his servant, Go quickly into the street, into the lake. Gather to me all the maid, the hot and the blind. And the servants, done as he had commanded. And yes, there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out now to the highway, the hedges. Compare them to come in. As many that are in my house be filled. For I say unto you, none of those men that we are supposed or that we are worthy will taste my name. None of those men will taste the supper that I have prepared. And there went a great multitude with him. And he turned and said to them, If any man say unto come unto me, he must hate his father, his mother, his wife, children, brethren, sisters, yea, even his whole life. If not, he cannot be my disciple. God is not looking for excuse makers. God is looking for disciples. Those that are willing to cast their way behind them. Giving all up for the sake of the gospel. Those are the people God is looking for. The reason why there are no marriage ceremonies in the Bible because marriage did not involve a ceremony. Marriage involves ceremony. Throughout the scriptures, we have wedding ceremony in the scriptures. We have seven days marriage in Canaan of Galilee because that is the loss of the Levite marriage. Jesus attended with his mother. There are a lot of marriage in the Bible. We have marriage in the case of Esther and the king. We also have marriages in the scriptures about Ruth and Boaz. So, we have a lot of wedding to celebrate in the Bible. The concerns of Matthew 22, verse 1 to 14, explain what we just read. Jesus spoke to them again in parable, said, The kingdom of heaven is like the king who prepared a banquet for his son. He sent his servants. Those who were invited to the wedding were not worthy. Think about those words. 
You were a Christian for many years. You pastor a church. You even are a bishop of a congregation. Men respect you. The community worship you. The governments, they flew at your phone call. But what happened at the last day? You are not worthy. You are not worthy to attend the marriage supper of the Lord. At the end, there is no denying of the truth. If you are not called up, that means you are not a true saint. It doesn't matter how many years you, are, you spend in the ministry. It doesn't matter the size of your congregation. If the rapture of the saint takes place, you remain on earth while the rest of the saints are flying. That means something is wrong with your ministry. So people are going to ask you, the same people that you preach to, the same people in your streets, they are going to ask you, sir, are you not the man that preached to us? How come other people have done? What about you? You are not going to lie to them and say, sorry, it's just that it's technical problem. Or God is corrupt. No. Nobody will believe you at that time. Because at the end, you cannot deny the truth. When the saints mysteriously disappear from the earth, you are not going to use physics and science to explain the rationale. It will be literal. Your eyes will see it. That people are missing. Graves are empty. Just like as in the case of Christ. An empty tube is there in Israel to tomorrow to prove that he lives. See, tomorrow. So, at the end of the world, there will be an empty tomb on earth to prove that the saints are gone. So what are you going to quote? Are you going to tell them, sorry, I'm an atheist. I'm a Buddhist. I'm a Muslim. I don't believe such things. But they will be great to prove that because he lives. So all hope are not gone. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. The Bible says, blessed are those that are called for the marriage feast of the Lamb. Because these are the true saints of God. Do you see yourself as a true saint today? Do you want to attend the marriage feast of the Lamb? God is asking you to just come. He said, let the, he said the bride and the groom say, come. He that is by them, come. Come and drink wine that doesn't cost money. Come and take from the rivers of life free of charge. It doesn't cost anybody anything. God has made it all free. Free for you. All you need, come. Let all that is tasty come. Let the sick come. Let the hungry come. Let the lame come. Let the poor come. Let sinner come. Let the dirty come. Let the rich come. Let those who are lost come. Behold, come. The bride is inviting you. And the groom has made himself ready. The day for the manifest of the Lord is now. And the Lord is saying, are you ready? Are you ready? Have you made yourself ready for me? If not, today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow might be too late. If the good man of the house has no what hour of the night the thief is coming, he would have watched and not suffer his house to be broken into. But I say unto you, watch. For in that hour and that time you know not your Lord doth come. The Lord will come at a time you never look for him. At an hour you will not prepare for him. When you are busy thinking of other things, having land to inspect, having business to go and check, marrying a new wife, the Bible says it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be when the son of man shall return. In the days of Noah, many were married, gave on a marriage. They never know anything until Noah entered the ark and the flood came and swept them away. The same thing, in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were going after straight fresh. And they were doing all kinds of abomination. They never knew until the day lots would go out of the city. And the Lord rain fire from heaven. And it made them an example of those who had suffered the judgment of fire till the end of the world. Brethren, you don't know what day will break tomorrow. The Bible says, Redeem the time, for the days are evil. If the good man of the house has known the good, the part of the night the thief will come, he would have hired that.
hire police, secure the doors so that nobody can break into his house. Brethren, the same thing with you. You don't know when the Lord will come. So therefore, be always ready. Therefore, let him that is at least come to the fortune of life. Buy salvation for free. It doesn't cost anybody money. Today is the accepted time. Grace has an end. The church age will so end. You cannot believe now that you have millions of churches. Is it when churches are gone? When there is no more place of worship? When to mention the name of Jesus means death? Is it then that you will now accept Christ? If things are difficult today for Christians, how much more difficult will it be when the man who wants to be worshipped is your governor, your president, and the world ruler? Brethren, today is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow might be too late. Come to God, all ye of our country. Accept him, and he will redeem you. He will be a father unto you, and you shall be his sons and daughter. God bless you. This is where we end today's teaching. And we want you to join us every week on this channel. You can even like our avenue on Facebook. Brethren, we are thankful to invite you to CGL. Below this video, we have our website, our link. You can support the mission to share with more tracts, to give mission booklets to many people around the world. The mission booklet link will be sent to this video link before we round up. And I want you to use this opportunity to share it with your friends, your brothers, and your sisters. Brethren, this is an opportunity for the gospel of the world. The gospel of God to be preached to all nations as a testimony before the end can come. Brethren, we're using this opportunity to invite you to share this thing freely. It doesn't cost any money with your friends, with your people. Just share tracts. Convert God. Share it with the people. The link will be added right now to this page so that you can from now on be able to see it on every of our video. So you can read through it. If you want to accept Christ or you have already accepted Christ and you want him to be part of your life, this link will be a great help to you. Just log into the link below the telephone number and you will be able to understand exactly what we have in store for you today. God bless you as you participate. This program takes place every week. If you miss any of our program, you can still come to read it or go through the video on our website at cgfnslogin.app. Or if you have any question, you can email me. My email is below the telephone number. Call us on WhatsApp. We will be able to respond to you. Or send us a message or text. Leave your text. If you want us to call you back, we will call you back in case of counseling or any administration or you have any questions, we'll be able to respond to your question. Brethren, we are happy to, and excited to see you. Join us on Tuesday in our Open House Fellowship, where we use the opportunity to expand the Bible verse and to teach the Word of God without fear or compromise. Brethren, we also want you. Are you aspiring to set up your own open house cells in your home, in your district? Just follow the instruction below, go to our website, fill out a form, we will get back to you. And when we get back to you, we will give you the instruction you need to be able to run your self-fellowship. God bless you as you participate. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let us pray. Father, we are glad because of your message that has gone forth. The marriage feast of the Lamb is ready. The bride has made herself ready. The groom is ready to come. But is the bride ready? Is the bride of the Lord, the church, prepared for the marriage feast? Or is he busy with other things like those men that were by Lord God of hosts, 
We don't want to be like the foolish virgin who were busy with other things during the marriage. And as a result, they missed the bridegroom. Lord, we want to be the, like the five wise virgin that add extra virtues to our oil. So that when the master of the house did come, we will be alert. We will wait for him. Help us to watch. The church, help the church to watch. Help the bridegroom to come on time. Because the church is ready. The people are preparing to meet with their Lord. Even in this end time. Lord, we ask your grace to be given us. As many, O oh Lord, that are still living unruly. Lord, just like you send your servant with a wedding garment into the streets to adorn them with white garments, which is the righteousness of the saints. Lord, as many that will come to you through this world, may you purify them. May you sanctify them and make them yours. That in everything, your name alone will be glorified. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Brethren, God bless you. My name is Missionary Collins Adoge. I am your host. Join us next Sunday at 5 p.m. where we use the opportunity to expand on the word of prophecy. We shall be looking at another exciting topic from the book of Revelation next week Sunday. God bless you as you participate. Amen. Before then, I say watch. The bride and the groom says watch. And let it that has ear let it hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. God bless you, and I say watch.